Lastly, uh, Coach Brown, and, I, and I'm so thankful he's, he's running around. Last week he was in Tampa, uh, you know, at meetings with the New York Yankees. They got new managers, so they're doing a lot of new stuff. And so he, uh, he was out there and he flew back and he's got the USC alumni game today. And, and I told him, I said, hey, if you come, it's no better way to start the alumni game than, than seeing Coach Gillespie, who was his coach in college and who also happened to coach Aaron Boone in college as well. Um, but he's probably one of the, the best guys that I've ever uh, coached with uh, amongst a lot, of, a lot of people and by far one of the best teachers of the game and that's probably why uh, he is coaching with the New York Yankees. He, he is uh, he's an amazing coach and, and the way he goes about it. So we're fortunate enough to have him here for, for a few minutes this morning and um, I'm going to let him do the talking but he's going to try to break down a little bit of catching and, and hopefully share some things that he's um, learned along the way and, and as Coach Gillespie said, try to try to break up some of this humility. <coughs> Pretty much always has his shin guards on. We were talking about it this morning. <laughs> Coach Nick was saying his favorite pitching visit was in Orleans. Uh, he just walked out to the mound with his shin guards. I don't even know if he knew he had them on. So, uh, <laughs> and he might have a cup on. I don't know. Um, I'll, I'll, let him, I'll let him do the talking. So thank you, Brian. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me this morning. This is, uh, it really is an honor for me to be here with these guys, these men that uh, had a huge influence on my life. And I, I'm not just saying that, uh, playing for Mike Gillespie at USC changed my life, completely changed my life. Love that man. So to sit there and listen to uh, Coach Gillespie up here, um, you know, saying a few things about me, it, it was, uh, Humbly, and I, I get a little embarrassed, but, um, but I love that man. And uh, had the, the opportunity to play for Coach Nieto at USC also. And um, the, the, the way that he cared for players and connected with players, he wasn't far removed from playing himself. But I just remember the, uh, the connection in, in <coughs> practice days, game days. He felt like uh, Coach Nieto was in the batter's box with you. He was, he was going through that experience with you. He had somebody to, to lean on, a friend, a coach, a, a guy that uh, really made a tremendous impact um, in just a short amount of time uh, that, that uh, you know, just had a special way of connecting with guys and, um, uh, and with that was able to influence a lot, you know, on the field, off the field. Um, I got done playing, and man, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. And I remember it was at Loyola High School. Uh, we we're, were warming up to play this game against Loyola, and Kelly Nicholson was out uh, just kind of after class and, you know, checking things out pregame before things started. And uh, this was in 2009, and we said hello real quick, and a few minutes later he invited me to come back and coach with him in Orleans for the summer. And uh, I, wow, I didn't know what I was getting into. But um, I just got done playing and it was still trying to play. Still trying to play, uh, hang on and get an opportunity to go to spring training with somebody. But uh, that didn't work out. But what did was going and coaching in Orleans with Kelly Nicholson and Chris Beck. And man, I, I, just, I didn't know which end was up. And these two men, uh, it helped me so much um, just in, in coaching, my coaching career and getting started with that, but uh, off the field, on the field, the friendship that we had, you know, we're living together, we just, ex the experience of being back there for six summers, uh, again, just a tremendous impact on, on my <coughs> life and, and my life in baseball. So it really is an honor to be here with these guys. Um, did, before we get into this catching business, I, I, I've got some stuff that uh, we can talk about um, and then want to open it up for questions also. Uh, but I want to let you know that I do have an appreciation for what you guys do. Um, I have a little bit of youth baseball coaching experience. This was going back a few years now, but I coached a uh, 12 and under travel ball team. Helped and then somehow all of a sudden I'm the head coach of this 12 and under team, and uh, uh, so I do understand uh, what you guys experience and um, uh, know firsthand, 
You know, I, talking about being organized, I remember a lot of days I'd show up, man, I'd have this great practice plan that I put together on the drive to practice, but it was like <laughs> down to the minute, and it was, and you show up to practice, and it's like, Hurting cats, like, <laughs> you know, first ten minutes, the whole schedule's uh, thrown off, and you got to adjust. So um, it's changed a little bit now, but not completely. Uh, but yeah, it, it really, a, a, I loved it. Tremendous experience coaching with with young players, and um, I, I think back on that time, and I get reminded constantly now uh, some lessons that I learned through that experience that, uh, that stay with me. One of them is just that everybody's different. And uh, whether you're working with 10 or 11 year olds or guys that are 25 or 30 years old, everybody's different. Um, but one thing that's universal, I would say, is uh, the fun, the enjoyment, that playing baseball, that being at the ballpark, that uh, whether it's a practice or a game, um, to create an environment where, where players are having fun. That is it's so valuable in teaching and learning. Um, if they're enjoying themselves, you got it, right? I mean, they're there, they're in the moment, they're, they're, they're listening, they're, uh, and it's just, it's fun for everybody, the players, the coaches. Um, so you know, if, hearing some of what Coach Gillespie had to say, uh, some key points that he hit on with coaching and then uh, Kelly and, and Coach Nieto, it's, it, 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 that is a common theme uh, throughout, whether you're working with grown men or, or you know, young kids that are just getting started, to create that environment where everybody's enjoying themselves. Um, get in, you know, Coach Gillespie mentioned something about my story, nobody came to, to listen to that, and I'm not going to talk much about it. You want to hear about the catching, and we'll get into some uh, specific stuff that is, um, kind of unique to this position, uh, different than playing other places on the field, I would say. Um, and to start with, just the kind of guys that you, you want behind the plate, catch it. I remember that, uh, that travel ball team that I, I was coaching, the guys that were catching at the beginning of the season or, or when we first got started, they weren't catching towards the end. Um, you know, I think it's pretty common that at a young age, the big kids kind of get put behind the plate, right? Because sometimes you don't want them playing other places in the field or whatever. They kind of fit the profile that we, we think of uh, when we think about catchers. Um, but the, the guys that uh, net now that we look for, but even back then, um, the guys that ended up doing most of the catching for that team were uh, middle infielders. They were, they were smaller athletic kids that uh, you know, had good reactions. A lot of things came really natural for them when you put them behind the plate, and they love to do it. I think starting with <coughs> the mentality to have guys back there that, that want to do it, because it, it is a different position. There's a fear factor, like Coach Nieto was talking about, you know, with young hitters. It's uh, a ball coming at you, you got gear on, but there's a fear factor to get over. Some guys seem to just be more wired for it than, than others. So um, as you get your teams and, and you're looking at, uh, you know, kind of where get pieces are going to fit in and where <coughs> guys are going to play position-wise. Um, just have an opportunity for the, the players that want to catch. Maybe it starts with catching bullpens or something in practice and, uh, you know, if, it's, if they enjoy it and it clicks and just it goes from there. Um, but opening up that opportunity for, for guys to do it that maybe haven't done it before. So, um, uh, getting into this um, catching stuff specifically, uh, I thought starting with the stance. Um, when Coach Nieto talked about it a little bit with the hit, with hitting and pitching is the same way. Um, you know, it helps players get in a good position to start with, and then just let them be athletes. And a lot of what we do is, as catchers, everything we do really starts with our stance, with our setup. Uh, there's a couple of stances that, that, that we'll talk about, but um, starting in that good position, really, uh, e even now with, with the guys that I'm around and, and, and coaching, that's what we go back to, whether it's receiving or blocking. Um, you know, the position that you, you get in to begin with has so much to do with what happens after. And a lot of times I think as coaches, we look at the result and you know, we're not happy with the result, but it, it's, it goes back to 
um, how we set up at the beginning of the play. So just briefly, I, uh, I don't want to get into this too much, but uh, a couple of the stances with less than two strikes, nobody on, <clears throat> nobody on base, less than two strikes in what we call a relaxed stance. So uh, the uh, emphasis here is giving the pitcher a good visual to, to look at, to throw to, and uh, also receiving, kind of the number one priority. So <coughs> comfortable, uh, I don't even want it. I mean, we're, when we're talking about this stuff, we're painting with a broad brush. It's hard to put uh, a manual together or, or uh, um, these universal things. Again, everybody's different, and uh, how we're talking now is completely different than when you're on the field working with players. I, I think it's, you know, really, um, ideally, we'd like to see players in, in what they do naturally, whether it's receiving or blocking or hitting, like, uh, I'd like to see guys, well, you know, let's crank up the machine and watch you block a little bit, and then we're making little adjustments, maybe an adjustment in the stance or uh, throwing the same thing, receiving the same way. See what a player does naturally well, and then adjust a little bit from there. What's going to help that player the most right now? And so uh, I think that approach is it's more efficient. Uh, less time, you, you, you have a player, but it's the best way to help players the quickest also. Instead of starting with, like what I'm doing, that you get like a clinic first, get all the catchers out there and this is what we're going to do. And uh, There's a lot that you can just skip over. You might not even need to cover it. A, a, a guy does something naturally really well. I mean, I would say just leave it alone. Don't get into the mechanics and have him start thinking about something that he doesn't need to think about. Uh, just kind of move on to something, keep it really simple, as simple as possible, um, to something that's going to help him the most with what he's got right now. So, uh, anyway, back to the stance. Um, just kind of a, a comfortable position where um, we talk about being low with our bodies, low with our bodies, low with our targets. I see a lot of uh, younger players, catchers, and the way they get a target, this is comfortable for them. A couple of things. First of all, we don't want the pitcher throwing the ball here most of the time, right? I mean, this is <laughs> nitro zone. Um, and we're making it harder for ourselves uh, because the low pitch is what, what most guys struggle with, whether they're 25 or they're 10 years old. Um, adjusting to those low pitches, um, that, that's the hardest. If our mitt is down there to begin with, our target's down there to begin with, kind of using our knees as a guide, um, this forearm, uh, elbow resting on the shin guard, guys will want to do it a little differently and that's fine. Everybody's body is a little different in how they're able to set up their flexibility. But uh, having that target low to begin with, that's helping everybody out. These adjustments are easy, going up to pitches. The tough ones are the pitches that are down at the bottom of the zone or below the zone. Um, those are the ones that give guys most trouble. So that, that relaxed stance, um, towing out a little bit like this, being duck footed, freeze, freeze the knees up, it seems like more. I see uh, some young players where their toes are almost pointed back at the pitcher and it puts them in an awkward position to start with. Want to be athletic. One thing that uh, I've seen done with younger players is uh, to help a guy find that position is have him jump. And how he comes down, usually pretty natural. And usually this is pretty close to what's going to be most comfortable for them when they sit down. Um, this throwing hand, with nobody on, less than two strikes, we want to have him protected. I think as you look around, uh, the major leagues, you will see most experienced guys with this throwing hand behind this right foot, behind the ankle, somewhere in here. Turn sideways so you can see it a little bit from the side here. It's protected. We just hit the foul balls. Um, mostly I see some young catchers with this throwing hand kind of forcefully up on their back, their low back like this, exposing the front of their shoulder, the right shoulder. Uh, want that thing relaxed, want it just hanging there so we can take a foul tip. 
you know, it's going to hurt, it's going to sting, but it's not going to stick with you as long. Um, now, with two strikes, your runners on base, we need to be able to block, throw. Uh, also, of course, we got to receive, right? So most guys, the stance changes a little bit, and then it'll, it'll get a little wider. We'll throw it out to free up that side to side movement, um, and uh, ways that their knees and hips are going to work. Um, still low target. One thing that changes is going to be this right hand, the throwing hand. Now. We need it in front of our body. There's a few guys that keep it behind and it moves, but I would say as a, a, a guide, it stays in the middle somewhere, close to the chest protector. We'll see some, you'll see some catchers keep it behind their glove, but then as they catch pitches on the perimeter, it will stay in the middle and their glove goes to the ball. Um, but we want it here to block. We want it here to transfer and throw. We want it close to the glove. Um, thumb inside your fingers this way, kind of a loose fist, so if you do happen to get hit, um, you know, you don't have those fingers exposed and get crooked fingers. <laughs> That's, catch long enough, it's going to happen, but um, yeah, it's pretty well protected if it does stay in the middle. It gets unprotected when it starts floating around out here. This is danger zone for, for foul tips. Um, so those are kind of the two main things about the stance. As we get into maybe some of the drills and uh, uh, you get players on the field and you start doing stuff with them, I, I think they'll find their bodies, will find the position, they'll find the position their body needs to be in to do this stuff. It'll, it'll, it'll be pretty natural. You don't have to tweak guys too much in their stance if you know they're able to do it. I think it, it gets back to kind of the, the you know, the, the type of kid you have back there to begin with because kids are growing at different rates <coughs> and they're doing all kinds of stuff. And so uh, if it's natural for a guy to, to squat down there and move around and do things low to the ground, he'll find these positions pretty easily. Um, let's talk about, just briefly, I'll run through some stuff with receiving. And um, again, getting back to the stance uh, and the target, really important. Um, catching bullpens is the best receiving drill on planet Earth. It's the best blocking drill too. But it is the most game like you're going to get. You're catching the pitchers you're going to be catching in the game, the distance, the speed, the uh, unpredictability of it, having to react. And it's the best there is. So if you do have pitchers still in bullpens, um, you know, in practice or warming up for the game, uh, I would encourage you to have your catchers be with those guys um, for receiving, for blocking. But aside from the bullpens, uh, we do a lot of machine work. Um, a lot of benefit to it. With, with what guys are working on, it, it, to shorten the distance, to make the speed, the velocity uncomfortable for them, uh, training reactions. Um, there, there's, there's a lot of benefits to it. There's some, let me get into it. So uh, we use the hack attack machines or ATEC machines. I don't, I don't know if you have access to those, uh, but if you do um, and you're working with catchers or have a, a time of practice where you can do work on the side or something, it's really tremendous because the machine does a lot of the teaching. Um, but the, the velocity, the distance, to force guys to do it quick, these natural positions that we're talking about, them getting into, they'll find them. They'll find uh, what they need to do as far as pre-pitch and what position their body needs to be in to react to pitches around the zone. Um, the issue is, is doing it safely. And a lot of times we don't use real baseballs for it. Real baseballs are good, but there's a, a risk factor. Uh, one, for young kids to the fear factor of, of the ball and getting hit, want to get them comfortable with that. So we do work with these uh, yellow ATEC balls. I don't know if you guys are familiar with them, but they, uh, they're the re uh, regular size baseball. ATEC is a company that makes them. There's probably some other ones out there. They're firm, but they're really light. And so um, putting it through these machines, you can 
you're simulating the ball flight, you're having uncomfortable velocity at a shorter distance, training reactions, and you're doing it in a safe way, right? Um, you don't want a guy to get his thumb dinged in practice or early in the season, spring training, because uh, those things don't go away. So, thumb, you know, bone bruise, get one off the palm of the hand, you want to avoid that. So these ATEC balls are great tools for, for training if you do have access to these machines. Um, also, pocket awareness, in that uh, if you don't square the ball up in the pocket, these light, firm ATEC balls will rattle around and you don't catch it. And so, again, the, the, the machine, the, the light balls are, they're teaching. Right? You don't have to use many words. Guys will figure out what they need to do to be able to get their mitt to these pitches and um, catch them in the pocket. So enough about that. That's, it's just a uh, great drill, great tool if you have access to it. And the safety factor of those light ATEC balls, tremendous. I mean, we, we, use, them, uh, we use them in spring training. We use them pregame during the season. Because again, we can't risk a guy getting his thumb sprained and having it affect him offensively or defensively or missing any time at all in practice. Um, blocking. Let's talk about blocking real quick. Can I ask you a question? Absolutely. So like receiving wise, when you're doing the drill, and you're, you, you mentioned pocket awareness, what do you want to emphasize in terms of how you want them to actually catch the ball? Like what should their hand be doing? Should, I mean, index and thumb should be squeezing the ball or where should they be? Yeah, 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 really uh, great question, and it kind of leads into some other stuff, but most guys, when they put their hand in their mitt, well, everybody, sometimes the, uh, this V between your index finger and thumb, uh, this is where you're catching the ball. And so to do these receiving drills with your mitt on, really valuable, different than bare hand type drills. You've probably seen catchers working bare hand stuff, and. That's okay if you're training reactions, um, but the weight of the mitt and the orientation of where that pocket is, um, if, you're, if you're doing receiving drills, I think it's really valuable to do it with, with your game mitt on because of exactly where, that, where you're going to be catching the ball. Um, having your hand, your arm, left arm, this is backing up maybe a little bit, but having this relaxed really relaxed is a key for everybody. They're going to react quicker. They're, uh, um, everything just works better if they're relaxed. Same thing goes for your hand, that we're not trying to squeeze a ball or, or uh, just overpower it with our mitt. It's, it's really uh, kind of an automatic deal. You get, you get your mitt, put that pocket in front of the ball, and your mitt's going to kind of automatically catch it. We, we try not to do too much with uh, overpowering, overpowering the baseball, squeezing. It's really a, a natural thing. Again, getting back to those ATEC balls, at first guys will try to do more with those because they're light. It's, you know, the regular weight of the baseball kind of sticks in the mitt as you're catching out of the machine or from a pitcher. Those ATEC balls are light, so initially guys will try to do more. <coughs> Over time, they develop kind of this touch, this feel, this soft touch of what they have to do for that ball to stick in the mitt. And then when they go back to regular baseballs, um, man, it, it's like it's like magic, <laughs> almost. It, it just it, they, they don't have to do much, um, but they learn it through the the, the velocity and the, and the lightness of those ATEC balls. So if that answers the question all right. Kind of develop some softness. Yeah. In terms of receiving. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, the, the term you use is again, I think for, for young players, even at our level, there's certain buzzwords, right? You said pocket awareness. I mean, I we use a term that again, you can tell me if you if you like it or not. But pocket awareness is kind of synonymous to kind of get your thumb underneath the ball because it exposes the pocket. Uh -huh more than not, sure. but uh, at a national convention a few years ago, uh, Mississippi State coach that works for the catcher said, to get his guys to understand what you're talking about, he said, hey, try to turn the doorknob. And again, as juvenile that may sound, I think it's important for the young kids 
5 to 25 or 15. Do you, do you like that term? Because it makes sense to me to, to emphasize positive, <coughs> and that's a good term, right? And when you try to teach your guys, well, oh, turn the door now. I kind of feel like he gets that thumb underneath, gets the index finger above, but it keeps the pocket exposed, which eventually it's going to help not get thumb, sure. not get bruised, because that's a nagging, season-long injury. Yeah, it'll, so, it'll I guess the away. question is, do you like it? <coughs> yeah. Yes. It, does that make, does that make sense? Sometimes at your game, you kind of have to learn something that clicks. Hey, Johnny, pocket awareness. Well, he's five. Yeah. I mean, you know, so again, I think it's a, it's a super exceptional word, but I try to think of things that might make more visual sense for visual learners to a five-year-old, a 15-year-old, a 12-year-old. So I, you know, again, you being catching, you know, specialist, just want to make sure that does that word make sense to you? Because sure. if it does, then we want to keep using it. I know yeah. we use that term a lot. Hey, sure. ball first, of course, right? Turn that doorknob, and it kind of emphasizes and does what you're trying to do, which is to you know get that pocket in there. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I do like that, and uh, it didn't get into it too much. Like I said, that that machine, if you have access and are able to do that, it's. Uh, Players figure that out for themselves, really. The drill kind of forces them to figure that out. This ball over here, like on the glove side, that I think Coach Nieto was talking about, like when they're going to have to go thumb up and turn that mid over and when they can catch it this way, they're going to learn that by doing the drill. Um, but if turning the doorknob or uh, I've heard guys talk about steering wheel as you, as you work in different places around the zone, how that, that mid turns, but uh, I think most of the time you don't even have to go there. Just put guys back there and you start firing those balls at them and they, they figure it out pretty quick. Uh, you know, going back to one thing um, earlier that, that Chris asked about was just even how you put your hand in your mitt affects that pocket, this pocket awareness. I didn't plan on going into pocket talk this much, but. Um, See guys that, that shove their hand way up in their mitt and this index finger is kind of in the, the middle of the glove there. Um, and a lot of guys, I mean, that, that finger gets beat up or the base of it. They get this kind of bone bruise at the base of their left index finger. By shifting everything over a little bit, it opens this V up more, makes that pocket bigger, gets that index finger out of the middle of the glove, and guys don't get beat up as much. You can kind of see that. That's how. I would put my hand in the mitt, but you know, again, everybody's different. Um, there's some really good receivers that that's how they wear their mitt, but they're catching the ball over here on the thumb of their mitt a little more. Um, but just some ideas. If you, if you do, if you have a, a young guy that that's an issue with, instead of putting a bunch of pads and all up there and trying to protect that hand and finger, just have them shift over. Making that B bigger, and you got more margin for error. Don't get beat up as much. Um, let's go. Let's go. Yeah, onward. Um, I'm talking too much, but uh, getting into blocking. This is this is a tough one. This is not. It's not easy anywhere, but especially with young players, I think it's even more difficult <coughs> because it's not a natural thing to do. Everywhere else on the field, if you're playing. Uh, anywhere in the field, you're using your glove to catch the ball. Now, with the blocking balls that are in the dirt, we're telling kids to not use your glove, <laughs> right? Sit back there and let the ball hit you. Well, that's not, that's not a natural thing. They don't do it anywhere else. They don't have any experience with it. Um, and so it's difficult, not easy, it's a challenge. Uh, good challenge, some things that just briefly talking about this position, uh, where we're going from our ready stance to getting our knees down, uh, our glove or our throwing hand, our throwing hand is going to be behind our glove, our mitt, and um, our mitt is covering this open area, this five hole, right, for you hockey fans. Uh, we want that down there between our legs. Um, got a chest protector on, got this mask, got all this protection in the front, and we want to use it. One thing that, uh, that from young kids, the more experienced players, a term that, <coughs> that 
kind of click with guys is catching the ball with your belly button. Instead of catching the ball with your mitt, uh, catch it with your belly button. And that seems to be something that clicks or you know, some variation of that. Um, guys that get converted, infielders that all of a sudden they get put behind the plate or like I said with young guys, <coughs> this position, they'll get down to this position in their eyes, right, they're looking at the ball, their eyes are telling them, go catch it, go catch it. That's just a reaction because that's what they do at third base, that's what they do at short <coughs> um, So that idea of catching the ball with your belly button, um, maybe a, a you know, good thing to try with them. Um, the fear factor, again, comes up to uh, help players get used to having the ball hit them. Uh, those light ATEC balls, incredible balls, just getting them down in this position and as a coach being maybe 10, 12 feet away from them with a dozen balls <coughs> and be throwing balls at them, short hops, helps if you can be accurate, uh, short hops and having them just in this position and just follow that ball into their chest protector with their eyes. And uh, it's something that we do early in spring training with young guys <coughs> to once again get used to letting that ball hit them, an unnatural thing, keeping the glove in the five hole, hand in the five hole, and boom, boom, kind of the chin down. Uh, intuitively, I think players will, a lot gets talked about with angles and this tilt of uh, your upper body, your shoulders getting over the ball is a, a term that you hear a lot. Uh, balls that are bouncing closer to them, they're going to be more over than they are balls that are bouncing out towards in the area of home plate. There are longer hops, guys are going to be upright. That usually takes care of itself pretty quick. Um, so starting with that drill of just having guys get used to the ball hitting them a few feet away, and here's the drill. Keeping your head down, your chin down, that mask and throat protector, um, <coughs> covering up uh, this exposed area. Don't want this, of course, right? But again, that's kind of a reaction, like, that ball's gonna hit me, I wanna get my grill out of the way. You know, it, uh, it, takes a, it might take a little while to overcome. But those ATEC balls that are firm and light, uh, we use those a lot out of the machine. Um, Incredibles, Incredibles are great for the same reason. You know, you don't want to beat guys up doing drills. They're going to get beat up enough when the game starts. Um, so, uh, like with the receiving, that ATEC machine or the, the hack attack machine, A machine, um, get where, here's the ultimate test is after you get kind of over the position and getting guys down, used to letting the ball hit them, it's reacting. It's reacting uh, to the ball that's in the dirt. It's receiving the one that's in the air, but being in a position and reacting, getting down quickly on balls that are going to bounce. And so um, that's something that we do, we do out of the machine. I don't know, maybe you have some you know, 10, 11, 12 year olds that are, are ready for something like that. Uh, where the machine able to move it up and down, right? The player's not looking, move it up and down, boom, put a ball in there, and they either have to receive it or react to the pitch in the dirt. Um, that's a great drill. You can do it with a live arm too. It's something that uh, part of the pregame routine, do it every day. You know, Gary Sanchez does that every day that he's, he's catching. Go out in the bullpen, and uh, before the pitcher gets out there and starts warming up, Ripping off curveballs, some of them are in the air, some are in the dirt, and he's having to react. You see the ones that are in the air, of course. And, um, and again, this is it, the ultimate test. It, it's, it's really it's testing that position, that stance that you're in to begin with. If you can't react and get down quickly, like you got to make an adjustment, you got to do something different, either get a little forward, whatever it is. I don't think you need to coach guys much in doing that. The drill teaches it, automatic. Um, shoot, I know I'm, I'm talking a lot. I'm taking more time. We haven't got throwing yet. Do you have any? Well, the one thing I was going to say, like, so a ball to the side, so either side of the plate, yes. how do you teach? So how do you want them to get to this part? Do you want them to square it back to the plate? Like yeah, side, yeah. Side to side. Great, great question, really. Um, <coughs> going side to side. Uh, want to keep it in front of you. 
really. And it, it, because now we're dealing with base runners and guys moving up. Um, like it's talked about with blocking pitches back to the middle, back to the, back to the plate. Really, you want to block them so they're in front of you, so you can get up and make a play on a guy trying to advance or move up. So, um, going side to side. Having, uh, let your hands help you. Just like if you were going to jump and dunk a basketball, right? Your hands are going to, your hands are going to help that. Going side to side blocking, same thing. Um, here's something that, that you see a lot with players is this uh, a move like this. Right? When their body's going, hands are coming later. To really be quick and get there, you want your hands helping. Your hands are going, everything, your hands and your feet are going to work together. If you're in a good position, it just happens naturally. Um, Talking about going side to side some more, that lead knee. If I'm going to my right, this lead knee driving down is going to help me get that way and get that angle. Here's something that's kind of common that you see a push with the opposite leg. And this lead knee goes up, and these guys are fighting to get over, fighting to get around that lead knee. But that lead knee driving down, um, the angle that gets talked about a lot. Uh, it takes care of itself for the most part, and you get there quicker. I don't know if that, yeah? Yeah, and you want shoulder square, you want to get around it to try to block it back to the middle, is that what we're trying to do? Right. Or just keep it in front of you? I, I just keep it in front of us, okay. I, I think. Uh, like it's talked about this angle and trying to get the ball back to home plate, but if I'm going to my right, right-hander's on the mound, and he throws a slider over here off of my right foot, if I pop this pitch, and I want this ball coming off, and I want it in front of me. There's a runner on first base going to be trying to go to second. I don't want it over here to my left if I've got to make a play that way. Um, so it's a sliding. It's not as much as what you would think. Getting back to the stance again, everything goes back to the stance. But um, having, having guys in a good stance with their toes out, if they're driving this knee down, having this foot open, this right foot open a little bit, kind of naturally puts me at this angle where the ball's hitting me and coming off. I don't need anything extreme, nothing like this. Uh, going left, same way. Here I am, got my angle, driving that lead knee, but starting in a good position. This takes care of itself. Um, Couple of transfer drills. Easy, yeah. So throwing. Some keys. Uh, <coughs> yeah, middle infielders make great catchers because this is what they do around second base. The way they use their hands or feet, uh, the transfer is talked about a lot. With <coughs> I'll, I'll say catchers, pitchers, infielders, outfielders. That time you have for a catch at the start of practice, don't cut that. Don't cut that short. Bear down on that. Um, I think there's a lot of value in the coaches being out there when that's going on. Instead of telling the guys, hey, just go down the line and warm up, get your arms loose, to be there uh, for that, that's when you're practicing throwing. And we all know that most errors, I learned this from Coach Nieto, most errors on the baseball field, whether it's Little League or the American League, they're throwing errors. Guys catch the ball and then they throw it in the bushes or throw it in the gutter. Those are most of the errors, right? Most of the time, guys catch the ball, and the errors come after that. So, uh, really valuable to be able to practice it 50, 60, 80 times before you get out there and the ball's hit you in the game. Um, and for catchers, this is a time after guys get loose, and if you have a throwing program, great, uh, you know, take guys through that. But to have time at the end to come in and work on their transfer and release, playing quick catch, Great drill, and just guys catching the ball, and you're throwing it to hopefully another catcher on the other side. That's a, another part of this: is catchers playing catch with catchers, or catchers playing catch with infielders. Pitchers want to play catch with catchers because they want them down, and they want to, you know, practice their knuckleball and screwball and all at the end. But that's for them. Uh, for you guys, for your catchers to get something out of it after they get their arms warmed up to come in at 50, 60 feet 
and play a couple rounds of quick catch. Um, naturally, they'll let the ball travel, being quick, the hands will be close together. Um, you know, get, getting into the mechanics of it is just kind of leave it alone. When you tell guys to be quick, naturally they uh, fall back to doing things the right way. I mean, they're, they're right. Give the right, give a guy the right goal, and his body will organize itself to accomplish that goal. Um, so, in teaching and coaching, if, if if whether you're hitting or pitching, you give the guy the right goal. Um, and it's simple. You don't have to get into the mechanics of how to accomplish it all the time. If you're dealing with an athlete, a good athletes, their bodies are smart, they'll know how to do it. And you don't have to break it down too much. So, quick catch, a couple rounds of quick catch. When I say rounds, maybe uh, maybe it's six to ten throws per round, where each guy, ball's going back and forth real quick. And then a couple rounds of maybe five, where again, you're at 50, 60 feet. The guy on that end is a pitcher. Guy on this end is a catcher. You're in your stance. You're catching the ball, and you're throwing it back. Not hard, but quick. <coughs> um, and now after five, switch. That guy's a catcher. I'm the pitcher. But to have that time at the end of this catch play, I think really valuable. Otherwise, catchers. When do we practice throwing like catchers? The only time we do it is really in, in between innings, or when a guy's running in the game. So how many reps is that per week? Like what Coach Gillespie was talking about with, with repetitions and uh, Coach Nieto. Like how many reps do you get throwing like a catcher every week if that's the only time you throw like a catcher? It's not much. And coaches and players, then they expect to go out in the game and throw well. Well, like Coach Gillespie asked, have we practiced it? Have we drilled it? How much have we done as coaches to help guys be successful in the game? And um, with the throwing, anyway, that's really valuable time. When you're doing the quick catch, so obviously the ball's not going to be in my chest every single time. Are you teaching catchers to move their feet so the ball's here? Do I want to move in this direction, or do I want to catch it and bring it, bring it here? So if it's side to side, because yes. we're not always going to get a perfect pitch to throw down on. Right. Are we moving our body in that direction, or which direction are we moving our body? Yes, great question. And that's kind of, that's the next step, next level. Um, for young guys especially, because their, their arms aren't what they're going to be when they're older, when they're 17, 18, right? The arm strength's not there. Uh, see this a lot when the field gets bigger. You go from a little league field to a pony league field, or, you know, you go from whatever, 60 to 90. Well, that distance between home and second base, whoa, that just, <laughs> that just got way farther. Um, so momentum, we're talking about momentum going in the direction of our throw, right? So if I'm throwing to second base, you guys are the pitchers, I want a little bit, I could have been bad, I'm excited to that one out the DVD, but I want a little bit of momentum with my body going in the direction I'm throwing. Infielders do this, outfielders do this, pitchers try to get this on the mound. Um, for us, for it's, it's hard because of the position that we're starting in, right? We're down in this like awkward squat to begin with. The ball's coming at us, and we got to turn around and throw it in the same direction we're coming from. Hard to do. Similar, this gets compared a lot to infielders turning a double play. But those guys are redirecting the ball almost all the time, right? At first base, if Coach Nieto is a first baseman, I'm the second baseman. I'm getting the ball from you guys at shortstop, and I'm catching it this way, and I'm redirecting it that way, or at shortstop. The fire extinguisher is the second baseman, pushing the end the first baseman. I'm getting the ball this way, and I'm redirecting it that way. Harder to turn around and throw it in the same direction it's coming from. That's why that practice I'm talking about at the end of catch, really valuable. But it's hard to get your momentum going in that direction. Or One quick point of emphasis, the term quick hands, right, a quick hands drill, it's kind of, it's kind of has a two-fold because kids are going to want to do, they're going to want to do that. The quickness is in their feet. It's not their hands. Your best infielders, catchers, and Brownie just showed you, it's just, your feet is what's going to make you quick, not your hands. It's just, how quickly can you transfer the ball from glove to hand? But your feet takes care of it. 
Mm -hmm. That's the key. Gain ground. Just gain ground to your target, but make sure you emphasize, hey, I wish it would, you know, really, I wish it would have been called quick feet drill. But it's, because it involves throwing, it's quick hands. And you get this, and this, and then they lose it on the transfer, and then they don't have a grip, and then they hit, you know, grandma, maybe, on the side. <laughs> it's about feet. It's about feet. It's about feet. <laughs> Move your feet, gain ground, the rest will take care of itself. Um, <coughs> For, for time's sake, maybe uh, like five more minutes if there's any questions that you have specifically for Brownie that you guys have come up with uh, in terms of our encounter in your, so we'll kind of maybe wrap it up, but just kind of rapid fire, throw a couple questions. Yeah. Brownie, Brownie will be here all day if we let him be. Um, well, I, I, no, I don't want to do that. This no. was not full or brief. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. As soon as, we, as soon as I get down, I got the shin guards on. We start demoing stuff. It's Absolutely. I don't even know where that clock was when we no. started. But yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, no, just a, a drill to help you guys get this feel is uh, push it, push back, um, on this side. <coughs> is uh, you guys are the pitcher again? Your second base, and just from the side. I'm going to get down in my catcher position, and Coach Beck is going to flip me a ball underhand over here on my glove side, kind of leading me into this throw. And I, I'm going to throw it, but you can see it helps guys get a feel for that direction, that momentum. Now, as we continue doing this, Coach Beck would move around, and now all of a sudden he's there. Again, I'm facing him, throwing the ball that way. He's going to lead me a little bit. And eventually, he's going to be around in front of me, okay? But I think it, that progression just helps guys get a feel for getting their bodies going a little bit for a second um, And less than a minute of getting back to a, a question Coach Beck had about, well, how does it work? Do you go to the ball? Do you try to keep your body the same length, going towards second? It's naturally going to go to the ball a little bit if it's side to side. Um, but we want this working glove to hand. You tell guys to get the ball into their throwing hand quick or be quick, like Coach Nanto was saying, you know, see players start doing this. You start reaching for the ball with their throwing hand. Your hands and your feet are gonna work together. We want the, the, the ball going glove to hand, glove to hand. So pitches that are on the edge, it's outside of the framework of your body. Uh, try to keep your body consistent and make the adjustment with the glove make the adjustment with the glove. But that order of glove to hand, really important. As soon as you start doing something like this, it, it falls apart. If you notice when Browning closes the front side to redirect his body, it automatically transfers his glove to his, to his thrown hand. So that's the key. It's your feet and closing your front side and get that lead shoulder in a straight line to your target, whatever base may be, that kind of that kind of lends itself to the transfer glove to hand. You know, yeah. he's going to turn his body. A lot of times, they're throwing, they're throwing already, their chest is already exposed. They're not turning their front side. And that's when you know, they're throwing the ball. Just. So maybe <coughs> too much information. I know that was a lot of time. But if you guys have any questions about anything, uh, any, but go ahead, guys. Yeah. Fire away. Uh, coach, we were coaching single A, so they're seven and eight year olds, so it's going to really be their first time receiving from a kid pitch, and then also from a, a coach after four balls. But when they get tired, you know, the squat position, they're not strong enough yet, we tend to have them on two knees. Any thoughts on that, like practicing with that? No. No, great. Well, with less than two strikes, nobody on. In fact, so we can't just... steal. Uh, in at our level in the single line. Okay. So. Well, yeah, I should have mentioned this. I, you know, I get caught in this traditional way that I was taught, but uh, you'll see a lot of guys now in the big leagues down on one knee with less than two strikes and nobody on. This is their stance, whether it's a, a breaking ball, a fastball, um, and they're conserving. I think, oh, for one, it gets them lower, right? So we're talking about being low with their body. No other target. This helps. It gets this left knee out of the way. I'm free. But they're also conservative. They're not having to use all those little muscles in their lower half to hold themselves up and support it. So maybe you start with one knee, you know, with those guys. Have them get in a comfortable position and 
I would still say when there's runners on, I know you said no stealing, <coughs> but just to be able to get the balls on the extremes and keep the ball from going to the backstop, then maybe that's the time to get up there on two feet where they're more athletic and able to go side to side. But when that's not the case, this is great. We are the two guys that we have uh, in New York, they both use that stance. You know, for Gary Sanchez, this is he's really good out of this one knee stance. Austin Romine, um, same way, uses this one knee stance a lot. And then when they got a block pro, they're up. So, okay. yeah, that's yeah, really good point. I should have, like I said, mentioned that at the beginning. Uh, the secondary stance you mentioned, like the throwing stance, what is it? Is there a huge difference when we when the runner on base or two strikes? Well, a little bit. Yeah, most guys are, yeah, just to get more athletic. Feet a little wider apart, butts a little higher. Butts a little higher. Yeah. Uh, most guys don't have to get parallel. You know, it used to be get talked about a lot. Like, you know, a jockey riding a horse, you're, you're like, well, that's not very athletic. You don't see many guys doing that. But the butt is going to be up a little bit um, to be able to get directly down the block. If you can't get those knees directly down, if there's a pause, um, it probably means that the guy's back too far. It's just, you gotta do something to get over that front side. So, um, yeah, a little wider, but a little higher. Throwing hand in front, protected in the middle of the body. That's about it. And it's gonna vary depending on the, the athleticism of the guy you got back there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How do you uh, snap the throws back from your knees to the pitcher? Well, good question. Uh, you mean uh, stand up to throw it back or throw it from your knees? Throw it from the knees. Oh, just like you caught a ball, does one leg go first? I see a lot of these guys just, they're throwing yeah, back as hard as the pitchers are at the time. So. Yeah. Um, what are the mechanics? I, I'll tell you, I would, before we get into the mechanics, if you want to teach a guy to do it, I just have him do it in the bullpen. Just tell him to stay on his knees and throw it back to the pitcher and see what happens. Yeah. Um, I say that because I have gone into the mechanics. There was a kid, high school kid I was working with a little while ago, and he wanted to throw it back from his knees. And he's really analytical, so he's thinking about right knee, left knee. And so I'm trying to help him, you know, just with the mechanics of it. And I don't know if it helped him or screwed him up even more. <laughs> you know, giving him something to think about. You just, hey, catch the ball and throw it back. I would say the mechanics of it probably left me first. So, like your knees are your feet, right? You step with your left foot, it would be your left knee. When you watch guys throw to second base from their knee or back pick to first base, that's usually, well, that is how they do it. It's you're catching the ball and they're. You notice his left knee body's still up. gaining ground to his target. That's the key. Yeah. To make sure that they got some momentum to their target. And, and most importantly, he might not have the arm strength to throw it back in the mound for his knee at seven yeah. years old. So I mean, you kind of be the judge of that. But even for his knee, he's kind of sliding forward, creating some momentum. So you guys can be the judge of that. Yeah. But the, the, the left knee is like their left foot. And is that ball going? back or is that ball facing the pitcher as you know, it was just to the side? Were they how much of an arm, you know, do you want to be back up here or are you just to the side throwing it back ball? Yeah, great question. Arm action, honestly I would completely leave it alone. I uh, in what we're talking about, your hands and your feet are gonna to work together. And so when guys are being quick, uh, quick with their feet, that, that, that's going to affect their arm action. So even guys that bring the ball down out of their mitt, some really good major league throwers that brought the ball down out of their mitt, um, you know, creating kind of a longer arm action, but really quick at doing it. But that arm action is kind of, that's almost like a, I'd say it's almost like a thumbprint. Not going to change it much. So don't mess with it. But in encouraging guys to be quick and do things quick, they're going to find whatever that is for them. Um, but again, probably something that you don't want guys mechanically thinking about to bring the ball to their ear. You know, for me, that was something that coaches said, oh, bring the ball, you know, and throw from your ear as a catcher. And that didn't really work. But um, yeah, it, it's going to find its, its natural slot, I would, I would say. Yeah. 
All right.